Welcome back. So we continue our series looking at the Syriac and Ethiopic sources for the Quran. And in particular, over the next few episodes, we're going to be looking at the paper of Sidney H. Griffith, St. Ephraim the Syrian, the Quran, and the Great Vines of Paradise, an essay in comparative eschatology. So we're going to be looking at part two of the paper, which focuses on the views of modern scholars. Perhaps we should call Ephraim the Aramean rather than the Syrian. I think a correction is in order. Is it right to call him Ephraim the Syrian? We all do it. Um, it's the convention. But Ephraim wrote exclusively in his native Aramaic language using the local Edessan dialect, which later came to be known as the classical Syriac. However, Ephraim's works contain several endonymic, which is like native uh, references to his language, um, which is Aramaic, homeland, Aram, and people, Arameans. One of the early admirers of Ephraim's works, theologian Jacob of Sarug, who died in 521, who already belonged to the generation that accepted the custom of a double naming of their language, not only as Aramaic, Aramea, but also as Syriac, Sir Yahya, wrote a homily dedicated to Ephraim, praising him as the crown of the Arameans. And the same praise was repeated in early liturgical texts. Only later, under the Greek influence, it became customary to associate Ephraim with Syriac identity and label him only as the Syrian, thus the blurring his Aramaic self-identification, attested by his own writings and works of other Aramaic-speaking writers. For the most part, I will observe the convention of referring to his writing as Syriac. With that out of the way, let's proceed with Sidney H. Griffith's paper. The late Swedish scholar Tor Andre 1885 to 1947 is undoubtedly the modern researcher who has to date most systematically investigated what he considered to be Muhammad's and the Quran's indebtedness to Christian eschatology in its Syriac expression. In his seminal study, Der Ursprung des Islams und das Christentum, he specifically draws attention to the importance in this connection of Ephraim's Madrashe on paradise, and he spends some time unfolding the connecting themes between these Christian liturgical compositions and the Quran. But before we go any further, what do we mean exactly by Madrashe? We might notice that it sounds very like the Arabic word Madrasa, a school. Here in Syro Aramaic, it means a teaching hymn. These hymns are full of rich poetic imagery drawn from biblical sources, folk tradition and other religions and philosophies. We see a similar eclectic taste for the sacred and the profane in the Quran. The madrasse are written in stanzas of syllabic verse and employ over 50 different metrical schemes. Each madrasa had its kala, a traditional tune identified by its opening line. All of these kale are now lost. Might the mysterious letters we find at the beginning of some surahs in the Quran be in fact kalas, i.e. indicators of what tune to sing the passage in? Um, have you got any thoughts on that? Is that plausible? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. What Andrea perceived was not a direct literary connection between Syriac text and the Quran. Rather, he spoke of one of the same homiletic scheme, and he offered it as his opinion that whatever Muhammad received from Christianity, he got from oral preaching and personal contacts. I think Griffiths is too behoven to the sin that sees of Muhammad as an illiterate preacher. This is a mistake. There is a false dichotomy between literary authors on the one hand and illiterate and oral poets whose preachings were written down by others. I think this led to Andrew Bannister in his book, An Oral Formaic Study of the Quran, to conclude that the Quran was entirely a performance work that was later written down. A modern example of a lyricist who practiced intertextuality, which is what this is really, is Bob Dylan. 
He doesn't typically take whole lines from others' texts, but more often he simply makes allusions to earlier works, borrows a phrase, reworks an idea, and so on. Therefore, the Quran could be mimicking the homiletic scheme, which you'd expect if the Quran authors were engaged in their work amongst Syriac-speaking communities. But this doesn't need to be only got through oral preaching. It looks to me that it is a mixture of both oral preaching and literary knowledge, which ought to be evident in the rich linguistic vocabulary in the Quran. This is not the work of someone without any literary training. The paper goes on to say, more specifically in regard to the works of Ephraim, and taking his cue from a remark made by Hubert Greme to the effect that in his descriptions of paradise, Muhammad must have benefited much from recalling images used by Ephraim. Andre averred that, in fact, on this point, there is a surprising relationship between Muhammad and the Syrian preacher. And Andre proceeds to list a number of convergences between the very concrete, even sensual depictions of the Garden of Paradise in Ephraim's Madrashe and passages in the Arabic Quran. It is at this juncture in his discussion that Tor Andre made the very controversial observation that in a stanza of one of Ephraim's Madrashe, one can even point out in his words a hidden allusion to Paradise's virgins. Andre quotes the passage in his own German translation from Ephraim's Madrasha 718. And here I will give a Google translation. It may not be the best, but it will give you a sense of what the passage says anyone who has abstained from wine until his death will be dismissed by the vines of paradise eagerly awaited each of them stretches his hanging grape meets him and if someone in virginity whom they receive in their pure room because he as a monk did not fall in the bed and lap of earthly love of the grapes whose grapes descend so that they are comfortable to muhammad In his later publication, Muhammad Sina Laban und Sina Lobe, Andrea expanded on this passage to say, To be sure, Ephraim occasionally points out that this is only an attempt to give some idea of a joy which no earthly mind is able to grasp. But most of his listeners and readers, no doubt, remained quite oblivious to his feeble attempts to spiritualize his sensual images. Popular piety certainly interpreted this staring imagery in a crass and literal sense, and under such circumstances one cannot blame a citizen of pagan Mecca for doing the same thing. And I think this is a controversial point. Was there enough in Ephraim's original text for the Quranic writers or the later editors to give the great passages a fruitier interpretation? Pardon the pun. Did they decide to move from a literal translation to a more interpretive translation? If so, this only goes to strengthen the case that it was a passage based on St. Ephraim's Madrashe. In our next video, we will look at two scholars who have contested what Tor Andre had to say about Ephraim's implied sexual imagery. We will hear about Christoph Luxemburg and also that of Dom Edmund Beck, who is an outstanding scholar on the works of St. Ephraim compiled the most complete critical text of authentic Ephraim between 1955 and 1979 as part of the Corpus Scriptorum Christianorum Orientalium. For now, thank you for watching. If you found the video informative, please hit the like button. And if you don't want to miss out on future videos, please consider subscribing to the channel. Bye for now.